This is Paul. Uh, would you mind taking care of him while I'm talking? That's very nice, thank you very much. Uh, be careful, he's not being a nappy. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, you might ask yourself why I brought a baby with me. To answer this question, I want to take you on a short journey. The journey to your next holiday. So, where do you want to fly to? Italy, Greece, maybe Spain. Maybe let's go to Bilbao. Imagine I'm the pilot on this flight. And please make yourself comfortable. Relax. Close your eyes and listen to my voice coming over the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Together with my first officer, Matthias Haas, we'd like to welcome you on our flight to Bilbao. We expect a flight time of two hours and 25 minutes and pleasant weather. Bilbao has still a wonderful 28 degrees cloudless skies. So please relax, feel comfortable, and we expect to land in Bilbao safe and sound with a probability of 95%. 95%? Would you expect an uncertainty level of 5% in such a situation? I don't think you would. Fortunately, you don't have to because aviation is one of the safest industries in the world. And luckily for you, I'm not your pilot. But I might be one day the doctor treating your child. So would you accept an uncertainty level if it was related to the treatment of you? or your child in a life-threatening situation. So how safe is, in contrast to aviation, medicine today? I'm a neonatologist, and I spent many years together with my team in treating children in life-threatening situations, particularly preterm newborns, babies like Julie here. Julie is one of 15 million babies born prematurely every year worldwide. She weighs merely 600 grams and is, is dependent on emergency medicine, immediate in uh, intensive care medicine. Otherwise, she has no chance to survive. Being born prematurely is actually the most common cause of death among children. But modern medicine is fantastic. Today, we are able to save the lives of these tiny babies. And if everything goes well, a baby like Julie has a perfect chance to live a completely healthy life. This is, ba this is Julie when she was three years old. Reality, however, sometimes is different. And I can clearly remember my first night shift without a senior doctor at my side. In theory, I was well prepared. But then, suddenly in the early morning hours, a premature baby was, was born, without a chance to call for further help. And it was not even so small, around a kilo. But the baby wasn't breathing, blue in color, and completely limp. We immediately start to resuscitate the baby, but the baby didn't respond like I had seen it before. We tried everything. Numerous attempts at treatment failed. My stress levels went through the ceiling. It was terrible for the baby, it was terrible for me, And it was terrible for my entire team. Luckily, we finally were able to stabilize the baby. But should such a situation depend on luck? 
This was really a tipping point in my life. I never wanted to find myself in a similar situation. I never wanted a patient of mine being in such a dramatic situation. And I never wanted other medical, te medical teams facing such a situation. A situation in which you simply don't know what to do. And if you think back of a situation, you have been stressed and under pressure. Um, how did it feel? How did you feel? Could you think clearly? Did you act in a right way? Did you finally make the right decision? When humans get under stress, a very uh, primeval part of our brain takes control again our so-called amygdala. Um, the amygdala is a very small and very old part of the brain that helped our ancestors in their caves to survive in a dangerous world. It basically helped them to differentiate between three different things. First, can I eat it? Second, can it eat me? And third, Or can I wake babies with it? Um, some of you might think not very much has changed even today. <laughs> But treating a baby in a life-threatening situation as a medical team is like facing a modern-time saber-toothed tiger. Can it eat me? Definitely it can't, but it could put an end to the life of a tiny baby, and also to my career. This means a maximum stress level. Tunnel vision, dry mouth, sweaty armpits. The normal reaction in such a situation would be, get the hell out of this situation. But this, of course, is not an option. Modern medicine is amazing but it has also become amazingly complex. So complex that healthcare providers sometimes face situations they are not able to deal with. Nurses and doctors make mistakes, especially in challenging situations, and lives are being lost or patients harmed. Trust me, we still cure more, cure more people than we kill, but we have to face the situation that medical errors are today the third leading cause of death in the United States after cardiovascular diseases and cancer. So what does it take to be good at something in which failure is so easy, so effortless? In other high-risk industries, simulation training is a must, for example, in aviation. By law, every qualified pilot has to train regularly in a simulator. They have to practice critical situations and they have to prove that they can deal with them. And the aviation industry doesn't want performance level to drop down to dangerous levels. And that's the reason why qualified pilots have to go back every six months to the simulator to prove that they to train and to prove that they can deal with these critical situations. And that is the reason why I have brought Paul with me today. Paul is a patient simulator. He's the smallest high-end simulator worldwide. And Paul can simulate symptoms common in premature babies. Medical teams can train with him, can train critical situations under highly realistic, um, under, uh, under highly realistic conditions. They can train technical skills, like resuscitation skills, But they can also train the even more important non-technical skills, like leadership, teamwork, optimal communication in a stressful situation. This allows them to be optimally prepared when the real emergency occurs. So for whom 
could be um, uh, simulation training be more important than for medical teams? The problem is that in contrast to aviation, simulation training in medicine is not regulated by law. And that is the reason why this kind of training is yet not part of the day-to-day -day routine in a hospital. It seems that it costs too much time, we don't have time for it. There are still hospital admin administrators who think it's not necessary. And of course it costs money. But there is a saying in other high-risk industries. If you think safety is expensive, try an accident. Believe me, medical teams want to practice and improve. We don't have to be forced by law. But we need governmental regulations to simu for simulation training in medicine to make it happen for us. As long as policymakers don't act, but you want finally, as safe as a patient, as you are on your flight to Bilbao, I'd like to ask you to do something. Not for me, but for yourself and for the ones you love and care for. The next time you are treated in a hospital, please ask your doctor or your nurse if they get the chance to regularly practice emergency situations. And if they say no, don't blame them. Get the hand on one of these. That's a feedback form. Every hospital has these feedback forms. Normally they are used to complain about the lousy food. Um, but please get one of these and write on this the following. I insist that my medical personnel have the chance to regularly train emergency situations. If you do this, you will help you, you will help us and Paul. Thank you.